derivatives are a standard topic that's covered in calculus, and if you recall, the idea of a derivative is that you take a function and you take its limit or of the slope of the tangent line, you, know, you decrease that, you arrive usually at a function. If you start with a function, you arrive at another function for its derivative. But there's an, a more interesting concept. In fact, the original concept when this was first being discovered was not of derivatives, but in fact it was this idea of what's known now as an antiderivative. So when Newton and Leibniz and those were discovering calculus, they actually started with something called an antiderivative. And the definition of an antiderivative says, if I start with a function, can I find another function that derives to it? We've normally started with f and taken its derivative, but what if we started with f and we wanted to find the function where the end result was f? So I find a function when I take its derivative, I get to f, instead of starting with f and taking its derivative. So what I'm saying is, is if I have a function, then this other function, big F of x, is an antiderivative for f of x if when I take the derivative of the big F, I get the little f. So again, usually we start here, we apply the derivative to, to get here. But what happens if we start with the output? How do we figure out what the input looks like? And I'll come back to this piece here in a minute. And the way we do that is, or a simple way, and sort of the reason that it's usually taught with derivatives first now, is that once you've become accustomed to derivatives, you can kind of work your way backwards. You can say, all right, if I have x squared, how would I get to x squared? Well, I know that the power rule tells me that if I start with a power and take the derivative, the power decreases. So if I need to end with 2, I need to start with a 3. But whereas power rule, okay, so if the power rule then I know I have to bring down the 3, so if I took the derivative of just x cubed, I would end up with 3x squared, but I don't want 3x squared, so I need to divide by that 3 here, so that when the 3 comes down, it will cancel. So the idea of a function, its antiderivative is this. Now, one thing that's really interesting, though, is that if you remember the constant rule about derivatives, said that the derivative of a constant is always zero. So for instance, if this was x cubed plus 1, the derivative here would still be, the 3's would cancel and you'd end up with x squared, but that derivative would be zero. And that would be the same if I were doing just, if I did 1, it would be the same if I did 2, it would be the same if I did 1,000. In fact, any constant, any constant is considered an antiderivative. So when we talk about the idea of an antiderivative, we usually talk about a family of functions. So we take the, the, the simple antiderivative, the one that makes the most logical sense to think about, where this is zero, and we put a plus c on it to emphasize that this function may be plus one, it may be minus a thousand, it, it could be all sorts of things. And you might ask yourself, why would we do this? Well, what ends up happening is, in, in practice, that it relates to what's called an initial condition. And we'll cover that as we go on. But the initial condition says, it says that functionally these things behave the same. They may just start at different levels. Think like in a physical process, if you throw a ball, the trajectory of the ball is roughly the same whether or not you started from right at the ground or if you started 10 feet above the ground. It would travel similarly, it just would be at a height 10 higher. So those initial conditions adjust some of that and that plus C allows us to think of that as like a height adjuster. Anyway, without getting too far off track, the plus C is part of the general antiderivative. So again, if we start with f of x is 1, then big F is x, because the derivative of x is 1. And for the general antiderivative, we just take the big F, and then we add a c to it. Now, 
As an interesting case is in if the out or if the f little f is zero. Well, then you might say big F is one, right? Because the derivative of one is zero. But then you might come over here and say, okay, well then the general antiderivative is one plus c. But if you look, the answer there is just c. And the reason for that is that that c is, is to represent any random constant. So if c is just some generic constant, then one plus c is also generic. It's not descriptive enough to mean anything different because we don't know what c is, so we don't know what 1 plus c is. So we don't have to write 1 plus c, we can just write c because, again, the derivative of this is going to be 0. And so this is a little more of a concise notation. <clears throat> the next one's a little trickier. We have sine of 2x. Now, I know that the derivative of cosine is negative sine. So if I started with a cosine, I would end. I would get a negative. So I have to add that negative on just to make sure that I don't that I get that proper cancellation. But I also know that the that by the chain rule, if I derived cosine of two x, I would get negative sine of two x times two. Right by the chain rule, we would have to take the derivative here. So as a result we have to divide out by that 2. So when I take this thing's derivative, I get negative, you get negative 1 half on the outside, negative sine 2x times 2. So that the 2 and the 1 half will cancel, the negatives will also cancel. So in doing that, we get sine of 2x like we would have wanted. So this is where things get a little tricky when we have we have composed functions here. We have it's going to take some practice to get to these. But one thing that's really neat is that this starts to come naturally over time. You the more you do it, the more you just sort of think about it. You you work your way backwards mentally knowing what you have to arrive at. So Think of this as having the solution and working back the problem instead of working it forward. And so anyway, negative 1 half cosine of 2x, you add a plus c at the end. And then finally, we have this, where we actually have two functions together. Well, in this particular case, we're just only going to take the antiderivatives of them separately. So since this is x to the 1 half, then I know that if this is a power of one half, then its antiderivative has to add one to the power. So I have to add three halves. Okay? So if I add three halves, or sorry, if I add one to get three halves, I know when I take this thing's derivative, I've got it, I've got to get to here. So if I divide by, if I divide by the power. I'm going to get this 2 ninths. Because when I rearrange this and multiply by reciprocals, that's going to be the same as 2 thirds times 1 third x to the 3 halves. And similarly, we know that tangent derives to secant squared x. So since tangent derives to secant squared x, it's the antiderivative. And then the negative just carries over because it was a minus secant squared, so it has to be a minus tangent x. And your general antiderivative is just this function here plus c. And this may seem a little overwhelming right now, but practice will make perfect here, and it doesn't take as long as it might initially think for you to sort of get the hang of it and really start rolling.